So, I would like to explain to you uh, where the x-rays in our lab are coming from. Um, and this thing isn't connecting. All right. Yeah. All right. In the laboratory, uh, we generate our x-rays mostly by means of shooting electrons at metals. Uh, here we have a copper atom. And if you have enough copper atoms and you put them in a sheet, uh, then you have a metallic material. And here in green, we have our electron. Now, electrons don't slam themselves into metals all by themselves. You need to encourage them to do that. Uh, so what we do is we apply an electric field over um, uh, uh, between the electrons and our target. And in this electron field, our uh, electrons will be accelerated and eventually will slam into the, uh, uh, slam into the target and maybe emit a photon. Of course, a single electron is not that useful. Um, therefore, we, have, uh, we try to generate a constant stream of electrons, which if you uh, slam them into the target will generate a constant stream of x-rays. Uh, the way in which this works is, I think, very well explained by Dr. Coolidge. And I do hope you will get the audio feed for this. Uh, otherwise, please let me know. In early x-ray tubes, the electrons necessary to produce the x-radiation were released by first breaking down a small amount of air or other gas in the partially evacuated tube with high voltage applied between the terminals. Operation depended upon the amount of gas within the tube and since this was variable, the tube was unreliable. In the present day uh, hot cathode X-ray tube, of which this is one of several different types, there is a high vacuum. And the production of electrons depends only on the size and temperature of uh, an incandescent tungsten filament with a cup-shaped structure surrounding it. This particular tube has two filaments, either of which may be used. The swarm of electrons, which is liberated or boiled off from the white-hot filament, is speeded up to a very high velocity by high voltage applied between the negative electrode or cathode, which carries the filament, and the positive electrode, or anode, which is called the target. The electron stream is focused to a very small spot on the target by the cup-shaped cathode structure. It seems that the electron stream striking the target at terrific velocity is stopped so violently that the electromagnetic radiation known as X-rays is produced. The efficiency of X-ray production is very low, and most of the energy of the electron stream goes to heat the target. All right, so to this day, we still use this principle for generating X-rays. But what exactly happens when the electron stream strikes the target? Well, uh, you can have one of two effects occur, uh, occurring either of which can be used for generating X-rays. And the first one is uh, by means of bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation. So what can happen to an electron when it goes into the target is that it bounces around um, and gradually loses energy as it does so. Now, to understand why this generates uh, uh, X-rays for us, uh, you should know that whenever you bend uh, an electron or whenever you change the direction of an electron, you can generate uh, an X-ray photon. So it emits radiation. So you see when, uh, when this electron goes through the target uh, along a particular path, um, at every one of these bending points, it starts generating X-rays. Now the energy of the X-rays that are uh, created uh, is um, uh, dependent on the energy loss by the electron. So in the beginning, we create high energy photons. And as it has bounced around more and more, uh, it's lower and lower in energy. 
the energy spectrum that you generate in this way uh, looks like this. Um, so you can, you have a maximum photon energy that you get out. This is defined by um, the acceleration voltage between, uh, between your cathode and your anode. So remember that the electrons start out in the cathode um, and therefore tr can travel along this entire electrical field. So if you have an electrical dif uh, uh, potential difference between these two of uh, 40 kilovolts, the maximum photon energy, X-ray photon energy you could possibly get out uh, is 40 kilo electron volt. Um, then you then you see a peak, so you see a maximum in the amount of uh, in the amount of X-rays that are generated of that energy, and then it sort of slopes down again, and this is due to the um, increasingly limited ability of uh, X-rays that are generated to escape the material. So if you have lower and lower energy uh, X-ray photons being generated, um, they have a very high likelihood of being absorbed by the target material, and that's why we have this reduction in intensity of our bremsstrahlung. Now, this way of X-ray generation is very nice to get, uh, uh, to get well, broadband spectrum X-rays, um, it is also nice in that you can tune the energy that you get by changing the settings on your X-ray generator. And this is very much used for, uh, uh, for medical purposes in hospitals where you have, for example, tungsten, um, uh, tungsten generators w which um, show a lot of uh, bremsstrahlung like this and which you can then tune so that you can uh, change the energy depending on whether you're shi shining through an arm or whether you're shining through a whole body. But for us, this is not particularly useful because in X-ray scattering, we do like monochromatic radiation. Um, X-ray scattering with polychromatic radiation has been attempted and theoretically is possible. It's just that the mathematics are very annoying to solve and uh, people have tended to stay away from that afterwards. Um, so what do we do instead? Well, there is a second phenomenon that occurs, and this, this creates uh, emission lines. Uh, Glenn already explained it a little bit. Um, I also had to look this up. Uh, so I found that to understand this, you need to understand a little bit of quantum physics. Not to worry, I went to the library. I found this book, Quantum Physics for Babies, and it explains exactly what you need to know. So what it says is, okay, you have your, your atom core, and around this core you have electrons in orbitals. And depending on the orbital and the symmetry of the orbital and the size of the orbital, uh, you can have, um, uh, you can store some, some electrons in that. Uh, these orbitals, or the electrons in these orbitals, have a particular energy. Um, so the, the two electrons closest to the core, they have the lowest energy, and above that the electrons are stored in higher energy orbitals. Now what you can do is you can excite one of the electrons uh, and maybe make it, go, uh, make it go completely out or to the, to the conduction band, uh, thereby creating this gap in the electronic structure. An uh, electron from one of the higher levels, one of the compatible higher levels, can then fall down creating X-rays in this process. Now, not, not all combinations, uh, not all decays are possible. Uh, this depends on the, on the exact orbital and uh, the symmetry with the, uh, with the orbital that it's supposed to go to. Um, but for copper, at least, we have a few, uh, a few of these possible uh, decay processes. So here we see the emission spectrum uh, or the, some of the emission lines of copper. Uh, so we have uh, K-alpha-1 and K-alpha-2, which are the most prominent and the most commonly used emission lines. Um, and we have K-beta uh, as well, which is a higher energy but less likely uh, transition. The energy of the radiation that is emitted is exactly the difference in energy between the different energy levels. So for, uh, for the K-alpha-1 radiation, that would be the difference between 8,900 uh, uh, electron volt and about 900 electron volts. So you create uh, uh, X-ray photons of about, uh, of about 8 kilo electron volt, which is exactly what we get. This is our 1.54 angstrom wavelength radiation that we all know from X-ray diffraction 
uh, that corresponds to uh, eight kilovolt, uh, uh, eight kilo electron volt um, uh, energy transfers. So, according to the book, now you're a quantum physicist. So, uh, this course has uh, given you more qualifications than you might have hoped for. Um, but anyway, now we, can now we can understand what we are doing inside our target or what goes on inside our target because this electron which comes in can transfer energy to one of the core electrons causing it to excite and leave the, uh, that, that, particular, um, uh, that particular orbital. This is then replaced by one of the other electrons and we get photo emission. What this looks like in our energy spectrum is like this. So we have our characteristic KL for one, KL for two lines at slightly lower energy, and we have a K beta line. Um, we filter out the KL for one, and uh, well, we, we filter out the K beta radiation either with a metallic filter or with multilayer mirrors or with uh, crystalline optics, um, and get just the radiation that we're interested in which is usually K alpha 1 and K alpha 2 in the lab um, because we, we're not quite as monochromatic as, as we hope to be. But if you have the right monochromator, you can, you can also separate out uh, uh, just the one or the other, depending on what you prefer. So in the lab, one of the most common X-ray generators you will see is uh, still using the Coolidge tube, and um, I've got one here. I don't know whether people online can see it, but this is one of the X-ray tubes from our X-ray generator. I'll have to be a little bit careful here because we have, it is essentially a vacuum tube. I hope this is visible on one of the camera streams. Uh, so it is a vacuum tube, a glass vacuum tube, which contains um, a cathode on the inside and an anode. And uh, in this case, or in most of these X-ray tubes, you have four exit ports. You have uh, two point focus uh, exit ports and two line focus X-ray uh, exit ports. So yeah, this is uh, that's about uh, what is it, 80 years old or something? Uh, technology still very much in use at the moment. Let me put that back. All right. Um, there's a problem with these things, though. Well, okay, let me show you first what they look like. So usually you have a, a tower on your X-ray generator in which your X-ray tube sits. And um, here you have different exit ports with some safety infrastructure to make sure that you don't accidentally irradiate yourself. Um, these generators are usually run at uh, 40 kilovolts, uh, 40 milliamp approximately, depending a little bit on which tube you have in there. Um, and uh, they produce a fair amount of x-rays. Um, but for some people, this is not enough. They would like to have more x-rays. And then this tube doesn't quite work anymore because um, you're bombarding this target with, uh, with a fairly highly energetic uh, ec uh, electron beam, which causes the target to heat up. And there's, there is a water cooling system in it. But if you increase the current on this, uh, uh, on this process, you will start melting your target. You can't transfer the heat away fast enough. Um, so people came up with different ideas, one of which was the rotating anode X-ray generator. Uh, these are a bit more expensive, um, but what they do is they spread out the heat load over the surface of a drum. So they're spinning around a drum with, um, with a target coating on it, uh, either copper or molybdenum or whatever energy you need. And by spinning around this drum, you distribute the heat over the entire surface of the drum, and you can then cool it more efficiently. This is a much more complex system, however. You have inside an ultra-high vacuum chamber, you have a, a filament sitting there by itself. Uh, you have your drum spinning at very high velocities, which is connected to an electric motor on the outside of the high vacuum chamber through a ferrofluid uh, uh, bearing. Um, and at the same time, you have a cooling line coming in from the outside into a highly spin, uh, a high speed rotating drum uh, and then going out again. So again, um, high speed bearings over there. So 
Um, these systems are a lot more maintenance intensive than your standard uh, X-ray tube. Uh, your filaments also burn out a lot quicker because uh, you're putting a lot more current through them. Uh, so you can, well, in my experience, we replace these uh, filaments every couple of months. So you need to open the high vacuum chamber, replace the filament, and then realign your whole system. Um, yeah, one of these rotating anode generators is pictured here. This is a Brooker example. You can change between uh, point focus and line focus by rotating, uh, by putting your, um, uh, your whole target assembly either vertically or horizontally. Um, so on these rotating anode generators, you usually only have two exits, which are either point exits or line exits, depending on how your target is oriented. Um, so they produce a lot of x-rays, but over the last decade, we've seen the emergence of yet another type of uh, high-intensity x-ray generation, and this is liquid metal jet. So some people thought, okay, if the problem is that we're melting our target, um, why not start with a liquid metal to begin with? Well, this is what people did. So uh, they took a gallium indium mixture and then sent it around in a, in a closed circle um, and then bombard that with a microfocus uh, electron beam. So this works quite nice because um, liquids conduct heat a lot better uh, and you don't risk melting your target because it's already molten. Also, this liquid lets itself be cooled in a much easier way than, um, than uh, any of the other methods. There are, of course, uh, this is also a high maintenance source. So if you have a, an interruption in your pumping process, uh, your entire high vacuum chamber will be coated with liquid metal, which you then need to recover. And um, like the rotating anode generator, you are burning through your filaments over here. Uh, so you have to swap those out regularly as well. Um, here's a picture of the one at the diamond light source uh, in its closed and open states. I'm not 100% sure. I think these things actually also have two exit ports, um, but it could be that they just have one, so don't, don't pin me down on that. Um, but yeah, quite complex uh, system, but if you need an enormous amount of photons, uh, these systems will give it to you. What we're using in our laboratory is, uh, goes a different way. So instead of taking a normal Coolidge, Coolidge tube, we have a, a sort of miniaturized, uh, optimized version of a Coolidge tube. So we have a focused electron beam, which hits our target, uh, and has a very, very small uh, target spot size. And by placing our X-ray optics very close to this, uh, to this source spot, we can use a lot of that, uh, of the emitted radiation. So the efficiency is a lot higher, um, and our electron beam is a lot smaller, and that means we need a lot less current for that. So our X-ray generators, are, our X-ray generation tubes are shown over here. We have a copper source and a molybdenum source behind it. Um, our copper source runs on 30 watts of power, our molybdenum source runs on 50 watts of power. So compared to the kilowatts that you need for any of the other options, uh, these are really nice, efficient sources. They're not so bright. Um, you can expect maybe uh, 10 to the eighth photons per second out of, one of, out of the copper source, but um, they're very stable in intensity, very low maintenance. So we switched these on two years ago and they're still going quite strong. So we're really happy with uh, with not having to deal with maintaining the x-ray sources. Also, in the current uh, uh, environment, uh, or with the current environmental problems, um, we're quite happy that we're not burning through so much, uh, so much electricity do our, doing our experiments. We're still, over the course of a year, the whole instrument takes, uh, still takes three and a half uh, tons of CO2 equivalent in terms of electricity. So we still need to be a little bit careful about what we, um, uh, what we measure and how we measure and how efficiently we measure, but it's a lot less, uh, um, it's a lot less well, impactful than any of the other X-ray sources. All right, uh, so much for lab generation. Well, so much for lab generation, period. Um, but many of you will go to synchrotrons as well. And as synchrotrons, they use a slightly different principle for generating x-rays. And I thought it'd be good 
to explain how this then works. So the synchrotron, they use a bending of electrons. And this works well if you have an electron which goes at a high enough speed. So if you, if you remember to what I explained earlier, if you change the direction of an electron, it will generate an X-ray. So you can do that by magnets. And in this case, uh, the electron doesn't actually go up or down. It actually goes perpendicular to the magnetic field. So in, in this case, it would come out towards you. Um, if you do this, you can generate some X-rays. And this is quite useful. Um, so these are called bending magnets. And you can put them, put them around in a circle. I'll, I'll explain that later to maintain your electrons. But hey, if you can do it once, you can do it multiple times. And um, in that case, every time you can make your electron go in a wavy fashion, and every time it bends, it will add uh, intensity to this. So this way of X-ray generation is called a wiggler, and you add intensity with every bend. However, if you are clever and you put these magnets in exactly uh, the right distance from each other with, the, with the, the right magnetic field and the right period between your magnets. Um, you can make it so that every photon that is emitted by the electron is uh, in phase with all of the other photons. And for those of you who, have, uh, who are familiar with physics, this means that you don't add intensity, you actually add amplitudes. And the intensity is the square of the amplitude. So suddenly, with the same number of magnets, you have a lot more photons coming out. Um, such an undulator looks like this. Uh, this is a particularly long one, uh, which was in Japan when I was there. So we have the, uh, the entrance to the undulator uh, to my left, your right, um, which is a small gap in which we have these rows and rows and rows and rows of magnets. Um, they, these are mounted on a rig where, where you can adjust the distance between, the, between these magnets depending on what uh, energy photons you need. So um, if you then go to a synchrotron beam line and they will ask you what energy do you need, and you say 12 kilo electron volts, then they go into their chart. This is the chart from I-22 beam line at the diamond light source. They go into their chart and they go to, the, uh, to 12 kilo electron volt and then they check what gap uh, they need between their magnets to get the most efficient generation of x-rays out of that. Um, of course, you can also go to higher harmonics, but these are usually lower in in intensity, and this is then, uh, this is then avoided. Uh, but in principle, in principle, the higher harmonics are also available for you. So oh, some noise coming in from the outside. Um, now, the problem is that getting the electrons to the speed necessary to give you these x-rays uh, takes, uh, takes a lot of energy. Uh, these electrons are usually traveling at, uh, with an energy of uh, 2 to 8 uh, kilo uh, sorry, giga electron volt. Um, and accelerating them to that speed, yeah, it's, it's, it's tough. So once you have them, you really like to keep them. This is why synchrotrons are usually built in a circle or a square. So you can, make a, uh, you can make a synchrotron with four bending magnets. Um, if that noise continues, I'll just close the window for a second. Right, uh, so you can make that with four bending magnets and you can let your electron travel around uh, this little square, creating x-rays at, uh, at every bending magnet. Uh, there's one beam line in Denmark that has a square synchrotron. It's called Astrid. It's in the basement of Aarhus University. And um, yeah, they create uh, UV, so not quite, uh, not quite X-ray photons, as the energy of the electron isn't quite high enough. But uh, yeah, it's a, it's a square synchrotron. And they even have one of these uh, so-called insertion devices in one of the straight sections to create a lot of X-rays uh, going straight. I did my, uh, one of my postdocs at this synchrotron, so most synchrotrons are larger. Uh, this one is 1.2 kilometers in circumference. It sits around a mountaintop in Japan. And um, this then consists of a, a great many bending magnets arranged approximately in a circle. And between every bending magnet, uh, between every, every bending magnet, you then have one of these insertion devices that can produce a lot of x-rays. And both the 
radiation from the bending magnets as well as from the insertion devices is used for experiments. So on this, um, on this synchrotron, there's about 80, 80 experiments running at the same time. So what you can do is you can apply for beam time. Uh, you usually get one to three days of beam time and you use as, this as much as you can. So you measure there for 24 hours a day um, to measure as much as you can. And then you get back home with a hard disk full of data. Um, so yeah, these are quite uh, these are quite interesting places to spend some time. Um, they're also quite stressful places because something might be broken at any point in time, uh, ruining the rest of your beam time. Anyway, these are the most common ways of generating x-rays. Uh, there are alternative methods available, but since, the, since your chance of getting in touch with these is highly unlikely, I thought I wouldn't explain them in detail, but I'll just mention them here. So we have free electron lasers. These are, um, uh, these are electron lasers that can, can then be coupled, coupled with a long, a long undulator and create incredibly intense pulses of x-rays, destroying anything in their path. Um, there are femtosecond laser x-ray generation methods as well. So when femtosecond lasers came about, they found that, OK, if you shoot a femtosecond laser onto a piece of metal, you actually generate x-rays, which is a safety problem, but also an opportunity. Uh, so, yeah, now they're investigating whether they can use this. Um, along the same lines, people have tried to make tabletop synchrotrons. Um, there's a group in Denmark that does this. I'm not quite familiar with the status of that, um, but I haven't, seen them, uh, I haven't seen them available yet. And, of course, you have radioactive materials. Yes, these produce x-rays. Um, and these are used for, uh, for imaging, imaging of, uh, of outside constructions usually, so uh, bridges and gas pipes, gas welds. So you insert one of the radioactive materials inside this tube. You put a um, radiation sensitive uh, material on the outside and then you can get an image of, uh, you can get a transmission image of how good your weld is. So if you want to know more about this, ask me and I will be happy to tell you more. So that's the end of this section. I would like to thank a lot of people who've been helpful uh, during my career. This list is unfortunately no longer up to date, but I hope that it still covers many of the people that, uh, that should be thanked. Thank you very much.